Um, and we have already 25 attendees. So uh, without uh, further delay, uh, we would like to start our session. Assalamu um, alaikum jamian. Thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, today. Um, it's uh, our pleasure to have you today on the first uh, simulation monthly activity for the Saudi Society for Simulation and Healthcare. Um, we'd like to welcome Dr. Atasi, um, uh, who is the head of the uh, organizing committee of this monthly activity. And also it's our pleasure to introduce our first speaker of this uh, monthly activity, Dr. Saeed Jamil. Um, he has a very impressive CV and it's really challenging to pick and choose uh, what to present. Uh, but I would say that he is one of the most active and um, highly, um, 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 I would say, respected and appreciated educationalist in uh, our institution. Um, he's a passionate healthcare simulation educator. Um, currently, he is a joint appointee, uh, appointed as an assistant professor of pediatrics and chief coordinator for clinical simulation and pediatric blocks uh, at the uh, Simulation Center at King Saud bin Abdelaziz University at the Ministry of uh, National Guard. He is also a full-time consultant pediatrician at King Abdullah Specialist Children's Hospital. He's a member of uh, the SSH and the SSH KSA, and he is serving as a consultant for emerging clinical simulation programs and also a board member of uh, Pedistep Multidisciplinary Simulation Lab at King Abdullah Specialist uh, Children's Hospital. He has taught a variety of clinical simulation related courses in a variety of forms, uh, such as advanced pediatric uh, intensive and acute care simulation workshop, uh, focused pedicim and online courses. It's our pleasure uh, to have you Dr. Uh, Jamil today and without further ado, um, I'm transferring the mic uh, to you. Please uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, kind introduction, uh, Sarah. And, uh... Dr. Tasi as well, thank you for uh, inviting me for uh, Saudi Society of Simulations first uh, monthly scientific activity. And actually it is my honor to, to, to start this uh, scientific program. And I hope uh, this program will flourish and uh, will help the society and all the members and participants to learn from each other. Uh, it was a bit of a struggle when Sarah asked me to, to do a, a, a grand round session and to what topic to choose. And I intentionally choose this topic because this is one of the, the, the topic uh, which I'm very interested in. And uh, I think this is one of the topic which we all need to work more uh, in, in, in terms of our simulation centers and in terms of our simulation learning and teaching. So I think I'm going to make a start. Uh, I'm sure you can all hear me, hear me fine. Uh, so the objective of this session will be that uh, I'll try my best next 45, 50 minutes uh, that uh, we will discuss this topic that you all should be able to define the human factors. Uh, you should be able to describe different human factors, uh, frameworks and model, which I will present to you. And uh, you should be able to uh, state how to integrate them into the clinical simulation and patient safety. And bear in mind, uh, our ultimate aim is the quality improvement and patient safety. That's what simulation all about. And that's why we're going to keep focusing when we discuss all these different models. Okay, so let's start with the introduction. Uh, I'm sure you must have heard this term alongside with the human factors. Some people call it ergonomics. And it is, it is a established branch. It is established speciality now, actually, even like a further subspeciality of the clinical simulation. So what it is, so it is a human factors involve all aspect of the way human relate to the world around them with the aim of improving operational performance and safety. Let's have another definition. It's enhancing clinical performance through understanding of effects of teamwork, tasks, equipment, workspace, culture, organization on human behavior and application of that knowledge in the clinical setting. Now, background to the, 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 the human factor is, is kind of more or less 
parallel to the background of the simulation because the whole concept of simulation and human factor came from the, the high stake uh, environments uh, and, and, and the backgrounds, especially the, the aerospace and uh, nuclear technologies and, and the military and all these, the, the high intensity and high stake and high risk uh, organizations, they've been, they've been working on these, these for a long time in terms of minimizing the, uh, any error uh, and, 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 and most of these models coming from them as well as we discuss along. Okay, so human factor encompasses all those factors that can influence people and behavior. And in the healthcare, they, what we particularly mean, we mean the non-technical factors like environment, organization, job factors, and individual characteristic as well. And we know, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna briefly mention some evidence that uh, awareness of, of these is very important in terms of, in terms of improving the, the patient care. I was going to show the Elaine Bromley's video, but I intentionally skipped because the video take a lot of time and, and I thought we'd rather spend more time on the discussing, discussing rather than watching the video. But I have shown this video and some of you might have seen this video before, but I'll give you a brief summary. The Elaine uh, Bromley was kind of index case to raise the, the concept of simulation and patient safety and, 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 and human factor in, in England. And uh, she, she was admitted for a routine sinus surgery. And uh, during anesthesia, the anesthetic uh, consultant struggled to, to intubate her. And I think, I think then, then the, 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 all this human factor came along. So they, they, they took a long time in terms of the multiple attempts. She, she went to desaturate badly. And, uh, and the longest story short, they, they could not manage to, to intubate her which resulted in, in terms of the brain damage. And unfortunately, after a struggle, she, she, she died. I mean, Elaine's husband, the, the, the Martin Gromley, himself was a, was, a, was a human factor expert. And, and, and uh, the, 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 for the tribunal, which, which, which was made to, to assess the, the, the root cause analysis, realized that it was the human factor which led to this disaster. I mean, all the people involved in the Elaine's care were very experienced people, you know, the, the anesthetic and ENT consultant, and they were all people who had uh, years and years and years of experience. But what happened? It was the human factor. And some of the human factor they, they highlighted from the Elaine case is the, which we'll discuss later on in the, in the presentation, was the situational awareness. This is, this is the theme will come again and again. And, Unfortunately, we have only 45 minutes. I mean, situational awareness itself, a, top, a long topic we can, we can, we can discuss in details. Uh, there are workshops set for the whole days and for, for situational awareness training. So it was basically the, the loss of situational awareness, loss of timing, loss of multiple factors, what, what happening around and, and along with the, the, the perception, cognition, teamwork, culture. There was nurses who realized the problem, but unfortunately, they were not kind of a bold enough to speak out loudly kind of thing. So that's, that's the kind of a summary of the Elaine Bromley, Bromley, Bromley case. And, and, and there are, the, she's not the one, only one case. And there are similar cases across the, across the, 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 the globe, which, which led to this drive of the, the simulation, human factors and patient safety. Now, just very briefly, uh, going through what, what are the, the, the root causes for the medical errors. We know medical error happen. And, uh, and, and if you analyze them, they, they could either be a, a human error or equipment failure. And, but interestingly, if you look on the UK data of the, 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 the NPSA data, uh, National Patient Safety uh, Association's data that 80% of these errors usually attribute to the human factors rather than the, the equipment factors. And similarly, if you look on the joint commission data uh, from the US and, and they have more or less similar uh, kind of a conclusion that the 66% the of the, the, the outcome of the Sentinel events is related to the communication failure, which is, which is one of the human factors. And on the right side, I just put one example, every hour and then you will see these type of pictures on the, on the newspaper that this, this blunder happened and this disaster happened and, 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 and most of them are led due to the human factor. 
Okay, so let's have a look on this uh, uh, brief example. So you you you, you got a, a president who is 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 in the night shift. He's tired, and uh, he prescribed the the incorrect dose of a drug. It's it's a typical night time. The pharmacist might be on call, too busy to check this, or maybe maybe not on the floor. Nurse who give the drug is not familiar with it, but she's too busy and about to go on her break. And she gave the drug without checking by the second person. And an incident happened. The patient was giving a wrong dose and patient suffered some adverse reaction. So these kind of, uh, kind of scenarios you, you, you might come across, especially those who are looking on the, 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 the medical errors and, and doing the root cause analysis. So let's have a look on the, these options. So what, what, causing, what has caused this event? So if you look on the, could, could this be due to the teamwork? Could this be due to the poor leadership? Could this be not following emergency procedure? Could this be circumventing safe system? Or could be correct equipment not available? So the answer, I'm sure most of you uh, will, will pick up this answer. Sarah told me, unfortunately, she, she blocked the chat because of some previous bad experience. But uh, I'm sure if you, uh, if you allow you to, to type the answer, so most of you will pick up that the, 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 the problem here in this scenario is very clearly human factor. So it's not, it's not a knowledge, it's just a human factor, poor teamwork, circumventing safe system, which is leading to this error, which, which you see. And I'm sure you, you might have seen this Swiss cheese example again and again. And, and a reminder for us that mistake does not happen all of a sudden. It happened due to the cascade of the problem. So the problem could be on the institutional base, on the organization, team, individual. And similarly, it will be multiple uh, human factors which lead to the problem. So, so, the, so the Swiss cheese have this whole, you know, and then you can only pass the arrow if you're very lucky to go through with all the holes, which is very unlikely, but that's what happens. So when you, when you manage this, this arrow to go through the, all the holes at the same time, then you end up having a, a, an, an incident. Okay, so what can we do? How can we reduce the errors? How can we improve the patient safety? How can we improve the, the quality of care we're providing? So the answer is, that's why we're here today, human factor. Okay, so I'm going to take you through with the some of the human factor models, and uh, some of them we're going to briefly mention. Some of them I'm going to uh, take you through in more details, which which I per personally prefer. So CRM probably the 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 model quite a few of you might have heard. Some I'm I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know how many audience we have and what different backgrounds audience we have at the moment, but I'm sure those working in the emergency care or, or anesthesia or intensive care, they are, they are kind of familiar with the CRM model, which again came from the, the, the aerospace industry, which, which it was a kind of a, a drive of the crew uh, resource uh, management concept and, and which we grabbed to the, the, the healthcare industry and we use as a, a crisis resource management uh, a, a kind of a model. And as you could see on the left side, there's a long list of human factors and about 15 here. And uh, all of them are very important and all of them are the one which we need to focus. And, but I personally found honestly very difficult to, to, to kind of remember all of them or memorize all of them or, or, or kind of a, a, a find an easy way to implement all of them when you are a very stressful situation. Um, certainly, you can pick and choose these uh, individual uh, kind of uh, elements from the CRM model and uh, design your uh, simulation scenario based on that. Or during your simulation scenario, you can have an objective which uh, kind of a particularly particular areas where we're going to focus that. There are other models, uh, as I told you, the, 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 the MODs are very used to with these models. So you can see this uh, human factor integration model, which is widely used in the Ministry of Defense uh, in the UK. There's another uh, model, which is a SEEPS model, which is a system engineering and patient safety model. But I'm going to skip these two models and I'm going to ask you to pay attention on the two particular models, which we'll be discussing in a bit more detail today. And uh, and I will I will further recommend you to 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 explore them more 
and use them in your clinical simulations and, and the patient safety kind of cases and scenarios. So I'm gonna introduce you to the team steps. And then after that, uh, we're gonna talk about the shell. So team steps and the shell will be the two focus model today we will discuss. And uh, as you could see, the team steps uh, is, is kind of uh, focusing on the five uh, areas. So, so leadership, situational awareness, mutual support, communication, and, and the kind of patient care team. So that's kind of five uh, human factor areas which uh, team step uh, suggests to cover, which has a kind of a two-way communication between these three uh, skills which we, we focus, the, the knowledge and attitude and performance, which obviously result in the uh, in, in, in the good outcome. So the team's uh, step stand from the, the strategies and tool to enhance uh, uh, performance and patient patient safety. So team steps, and uh, it's 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 an evidence based model. It based on the thirty years experience of, of of the patient safety. And again, we don't have time to to underpin all the evidence. If anybody interested, uh, you can personally contact me. I can I can sign post all the references and the evidence. And, uh, but we're just going to underpin briefly the, the elements. So before I go in detail to the team steps, I will introduce you the other model, which we will uh, discuss uh, in today's uh, session, which is the shell model. And uh, you'll be surprised again, another model which came from the, the, the uh, airline industry. So, so British Airline Pilots Association uh, introduced this model a little while ago, and I was quite surprised, 1972, uh, man and machine. And uh, I quite like actually this model because uh, if you join these two models, it gives you a very good picture of, of like a more bird eye view of the human factors and, and covering all the aspects of the human factors. So let's have a look on the shell first. So as you could uh, see, shell is stand from the uh, software, S from the software, H from the hardware, E from environment, and there are two L in terms of the liveware. And uh, let's discuss them one by one. So the software in the shell model is all the software we use in terms of our organization. So these are the guidelines, the protocol, algorithms, checklists, signs, symbols. I mean, our, our, our kind of environment is full with these kind of softwares around. Now, what does that mean? I mean, what do they do? So that's the key point, you know. So are the softwares easily accessible? Are they appropriately kind of a design? Are they purpose built? Are they easy to follow? As you could see in this picture, very easy to follow. Right on the right side, as you could see. No, right on the left side and left on the right side. Or they design with, with kind of a flexible, so let's see this example and then see the other example. So if the, the, the guidelines and the protocols are very rigid, very complicated, not easy to follow, then what happens? Then the people will create a shortcut as you could see on the right side on the top. Now, could the shortcut cause problem? Well, it might not cause problem, but it can cause problem. But in, 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 in extreme, kind of a stressful situations. If your team is always used to do the shortcut, then it can lead, it can lead to disaster. So the message is that the software is the, the first human factor which we need to focus. And, 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 and if you're working in different organizations, I'm sure there are nurses here, there's a physiotherapist here, there's a respiratory therapist here. So they need to follow their own guidelines. And, 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 and believe me or not, go back to your workplace and, and, and think about how many APPs, DPPs, protocols you have which are easy accessible. I mean, I, 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 when I was doing this presentation, believe me or not, I struggle myself. So we have so many protocol, but are they on the one click? No, it's very difficult even to find where it is on the internet or internet or on a file somewhere. So just think about it. And when you, when you even look on the protocol, is it easy to read an emergency situation? Can you find out the information you need? Food for thought, have a look. So this is the kind of a human factor we can we can address in through simulation you can create a simulated environment you could do in situ like a little run among your your team to 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 have a 
kind of a brief case of something, whatever blood transfusion, let's find out the transfusion protocol and see what happened or whatever the, the, the severe asthma attack or, or in ITU, whatever. Any, you, you could, whichever environment you, you, you're working, whichever protocol you want to test, you could do a little in situ run, you could do a, a, a proper design simulation scenario in the same lab as well, uh, identifying or covering these, these kind of human factors. So let's move to the second one, which is the hardware. Hardware, again, we have all the these, I mean, there's an endless list of this hardware, and I'm not going to go to these names anyway, which are around us. And again, they're all kind of a equipments which we use day to day, but they could be very dangerous if they don't work on the time. So again, having awareness of these hardwares, having troubleshooting, solution for the troubleshooting, we need to know, we need to learn, we need to keep testing. And again, you can integrate into the human factors simulation as well. Now, environment is very important and, 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 and I'm sure I don't need to explain you in further. If you're tired, your efficacy will decrease. If your environment is very cold, very warm, your efficacy will increase, sorry, decrease. Similarly, the way your workspace is designed, the way your lighting is designed, it all affect, we are human. So anything around the environment which affect us eventually affect our performance and which can kind of end up in, in, in kind of a, uh, affecting the, the patient as well. Now, L in the shell model is liveware and there's two L here, as you could see a central liveware and a peripheral liveware. And this is the team. So central liveware is you in the team and peripheral liveware is the other members of the team. So put it this way together, it's, it's basically a team. And basically what that means is the, the non-technical skills, which probably the one we're gonna discuss more and focus more. Now, if I say the, where the teams stand, so if you merge shell and teams together, so the team is basically liveware in the shell model. And that's why I, I told you that we'll discuss teams after I present you the shell model first. So there we are. So that's the different non-technical, and it's the same as the CRM model as well. So you can put the CRM model here as well within the shell. So it will come as a liveware, which is the kind of a you and the team around you. The, the, the actual humans, although the all factors are human factor, but that's the actual human factors. So here we are, so the long list of the non-technical skill, I'm gonna skip this and I'm gonna come back to the team steps again. So team steps uh, model uh, encompass of the four key areas you could see in the middle and, and the fifth as a, as a circle. So the leadership, situational awareness, mutual support, communication, and I told you the, the, the team around this is the key. So obviously the team building, team work, team performance, and which result in the good outcome. And here are the, the five uh, different aspects of the, 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 the team's model. So I think we go before we're gonna do the, these model in more detail. So we, we, we are about, uh, I think I'm halfway of my presentation. We're gonna take a commercial break. There we are, so commercial break. So I'm gonna show you a video and I'm gonna ask you to pay attention to this video. So here we are. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. Well, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? So I'm not sure how good you could hear because I unfortunately I cannot have any feedback because I'm not following any chat. So I don't know. I mean, You're hearing very well. Uh, it was clear, Dr. Say. Okay. So I don't know. Is the chat allowed or no? Because I'm not sure the 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 uh, those who are focusing did you i mean it's a nice video to watch but did anybody notice any changes 
honestly, when I saw this video first time, I did not pay attention to a single change at all. So I think I, I it is allowed to, now, uh, Dr. Uh, Junior. It forward. Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until just watch it again, is no. out. Take her away. Sorry, it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest. Lady Smythe. So I think that's lead to our discussion about the selective attention. I mean, this is a this is a classical work. I mean, I, I like this video. Every time I watch this, I love it. Because when I first time saw this video, I did not pay attention to a single change. And honestly, when I saw the rest of the video, and I was surprised how the thing. And this is exactly what happened in the stressful situations the high stake environment, especially which we are working healthcare or, or I mentioned the other industries, the aerospace industries or whatever nuclear industry, the Ministry of Defense and et cetera and et cetera. So that lead to the discussion of this topic of uh, situation awareness and selective attention. So we, we, selective attention is the process by which people find a selected information which they paid attention to, for example, you recently watched this video, we were all paying attention to this gentleman who was talking and finding who was the culprit. So we, we forget all the other changes very easily. I mean, you could see another example of the cocktail party. So you, you're in the busy restaurant, you might kind of focus him on the neighboring table rather than your own table. It's an unconscious process. The selective attention is an unconscious process, but that which is sometimes good as well, but it, it, it can lead to the problem, especially if you're working in, in the stressful situation, emergency situation, high demand situation, then if you, if you, if your attention is very selected, then you will lose the situational awareness. And there's a lot of work done, which suggests that that's how the, the incident happened. Let's have a look on this as well. See, see, see how, do, how do you do with that? I'll give you 30 seconds of this. I'm sure some of you might've seen this before, but let's have a, let's have a give it a go to read this. Okay, so I'm sure I'm sure most of you surprised that despite there's not a single well there might become a few two words which are correct but most of the words are not written in the correct order but despite that most of us will easily manage to read it without any problems and and, and the reason is why because even our brain does not pay attention too much in detail it only so what our brain does it, it just look on the first letter and the last letter and then it recognizes the pattern so our brain recognizes the pattern and we pick up the word so that's the, the the second concept which comes as a pattern recognition same as this picture some of see some 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 will see different and some will see different i leave it up to you so but what happened then so this this selective attention and uh, uh, this pattern recognition help us to solve the problem, but it can sometimes divert us to, 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 to from the real attention as well. So, so let's say if you're doing a diagnosis and, 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 and you, 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 you recognize a wrong pattern, then you are in very dangerous to go a, a, a blind path where there will be no ending. So that's why we have to have a situation awareness, a broader picture of what's happening around us, a, a multiple ideas, a more open discussions for every decision, and so we can we can we can do the, the the better judgment. So what is the situational awareness? The perception of the element in the environment within a volume of time and space, and the comprehension of their meaning 
and the projection of their status into the near future. So that's the situational awareness. And as I mentioned, it's a whole topic. And if I if I get opportunity in future, sometime I might cover the situational awareness in more detail. Okay, so what, what it is, so, so getting information and understanding information and then using this information to, 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 to plan ahead in, in, in terms of what's coming next. And uh, as, I, as, as I said, there's a lot of work being done. I mean, the, you know, the firefighters, they use situational awareness, uh, the, the, the police, they all use this, this, the concept of situational awareness because that's key to their job because a, a slight mistake will end up lot of not only the, the, the primary victim life, but even the, the, the people who are helping them their lives as well, if they don't do the proper situation awareness. How we can integrate the situation awareness? So here we are. So the, the Teams model suggests some, some, some tools. Uh, uh, so they, 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 they have introduced the step tool and I am safe checklist tool, which is kind of covering the situational monitoring. And uh, you can you can integrate these tools into your simulations, or or you can you can you can just plan the the the, the, the simulation. So steps mean the, the the S from the status of the patient, T team member, E environment, and the P progress towards the, the the shared goal. So this this is the word we will hear again and again in the situation where the shared mental model. So we we want to achieve a shared mental model in the situational awareness so we can we can all be on the same page and we could do the right decision for the patients. Let's move to the other area of the, 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 the team steps, which is the communication. The single biggest problem in the communication is the illusion that it's happened, but not sure. And that's the problem that we, we think it's happened and it's not happened. So I'm gonna kind of uh, put this question again. How can we do this? Very easy. We can do this, integrate this into any sort of simulation. And again, there are multiple tools. So I'm going to introduce you some of the steps tools. And I don't have time to go in more, more detail. So it will be more like introduction. And you can find out details yourself or contact me. So as far possibly the one you might have already been aware, because that had been widely used, especially in the, the intensive care and, and the accident emergency or other departments. I would strongly recommend to, to, to pay attention on as bars in your simulations. Possibly you could, you could introduce, this is one of the thing in, in every single simulation encounter you, you, you're organizing because they're always a kind of a, a, a situation where the one person will tell the information to other person. Dr. Jamil, uh, the, are you still with us? I think uh, we have lost uh, Dr. Jamil. Uh, we'll just give him uh, uh, one minute to reconnect back. It's the usual uh, technical issues that we run into. Um, in the meantime, uh, there uh, we have received a few questions that I believe that they've been answered already by um, the presentation so far. Uh, one of the questions uh, we received via email is uh, what is human factor? I believe the first slide has... Uh, carried out the definition with a nice explanation. We're still waiting to hear how can we utilize uh, simulation to address the um, uh, human factors that uh, um, Dr. Jamil is uh, um, very nicely elaborating, which is basically the crisis resource management uh, basics and uh, principles.
we applauded Jai's uh, for this uh, technical uh, issue and Dr. Said is trying to reconnect back. Well, Dr. Asara, thank you very much uh, for the uh, for being the hostess actually for this uh, great talk. And uh, I, I wonder uh, which model you would pick in in, in your um, as an educationalist and as a clinician uh, when it comes uh, to to real crisis and knowing that you're an intensivist, for example. So I guess the question um, uh, has to be what is exactly you're trying to fix and what is exactly you're trying to improve. Um, so I like the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, I would say the classification of the shell model, which kind of makes it easier for us to decide on which um, aspect that we're trying to improve and work on. Uh, in particular, the, um, the, the, the soft uh, part uh, uh, of it, uh, which we tend to underutilize simulation for. So for example, um, utilizing the uh, um, simulation to uh, test our new protocols, pilot them, troubleshoot them. Um, so I, I believe it's one of the best models. Um, um, back I, in case you want me to join again, I'm back. Sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, yes, Dr. Jamil. Sorry, yes, we're trying to fill it up is, the it, time. This is called human factor. You know what happened? So, my daughter pulled the Wi Fi <laughs> switch off and put her <laughs> laptop switch in. There you go. <laughs> oh and my you, god, that's the best example. Okay, example of human factor. So, the whole, yes. whole house is out of the any internet connection, and I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> no worries, no worries. We still have uh, like 10, 12 minutes uh, yeah. for the presentation. And I think a lot of people are trying to uh, uh, get to the part where we can yeah. utilize simulation uh, to enhance these human yeah. factors and improve uh, those Just points. How do I share my screen again? Mm. There we are. So that's PowerPoint. So can you share, uh, can you see my slide? Yes, it's okay. there. So I'm really sorry with the with the with the audience. No worries, it's okay. It okay. happens. So call out, call out is the uh, tool which we recommend to teach during the, uh, especially the codes mm. or mock codes or 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 any of the the team simulation. So call out means basically calling out a abnormality which you focus. So example is here. So leader airway status, resident airway clear, leader breathe sounds nurse or resident breathe sounds clear. So this is a call out. So speaking out, again, everybody can hear and it will create a share mental model again. Now check back is the example of the closed loop communication. And again, you can you can in, in, in integrate the check back very easily and, and closed loop communication. You must have heard this again and again before as well. So the closed loop communication is a doctor, have you given the no, doctor, give the Benadryl, whatever, adrenaline, nurse, Adrenaline given. Okay, so that's kind of a give, getting a feedback to make sure that the the, the the receiver and the 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 source both know that the the knowledge is received and the knowledge is acted upon. Now, hands off is a very interesting uh, tool, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, sum up in the in the next five seven minutes, which is the tool for the handover specifically because the handover is another great area and it's very specifically obviously with, with the nurses or people who are working in the high intensity situations uh, the anesthetist or the ER or the, the intensive care or honestly anybody the respiratory therapist changing shifts they need to tell the other respiratory therapist who is coming to the shift so, so, so I pass a baton is a very good example of, of covering the all key aspects of the, the handover, which you can do. And again, there is a detailed work done on it and there's a scenarios available. There is a, there's examples available and, and you can easily incorporate into your, uh, the, the, the in-situ simulations or, or, or kind of lab simulations as well. Now, there are multiple team learning tools as well. So I told you the team is the, the fourth element of the, the, uh, 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 the, the, the team's model and the brief huddle and debrief. So debriefing we use quite a lot anyway in the, in the, in the simulation. 
uh, but the brief and hurdles uh, are the other aspects which you can you can incorporate and and then you can design the the simulation or again like a like a quick in situ simulation on 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 these these different models so so the brief is the the, the situation huddle if you have any ad hoc situation if somebody off sick there's a nurse not there there's an no emergency bed available uh, or whatever so any 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 of the the emergent situation you can call a quick huddle and and get everybody on the same page and and again achieve the same uh, share mentor model uh mutual support or the teamwork is very important element so 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 we as i mentioned you i'm briefly mentioning you rather than going in much of the detail of all of these different tools and models but the the, the four element of the steps are the situational awareness mutual support communication leadership so among the mutual support is the because we 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 sometimes we have to be more open and assertive among the team in terms of giving the suggestions so the the there's a there's a couple of models they have introduced and which which I, I quite like it's the two challenge rule and the cus concept so the two challenge rule is the so for example nurse call the resident can you please come and review this uh, patient I'm, i'm 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 not happy with the patient and and the typical in the middle of the night the resident oh well i know i know this patient i saw him earlier nothing to worry it and put the phone down nurse will call second time again look i'm worried about this patient i'm concerned i'm uncomfortable and 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 probably is not safe so that's what that's what we call the cuss word c u s i'm concerned i'm uncomfortable it's a safety issue here and the two, two challenge molar is second time she give a chance if the the person on the other side is still not listening then you have to escalate the the the, the, the situation to the to the higher up so this is very important and uh, aspect of the patient safety and team communication and again the cus and the two challenge rule can easily incorporate now one thing i would suggest here if you planning a simulation scenario and trying to practice these different tools it probably be better if you teach the learners or your audience these tool beforehand so what i would suggest that you introduce them as a knowledge or or show them a video or or give them some information about these tools and then let them practice in the scenario whether they using the 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 whether it's a sbar model or whether it's a call out or 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 kind of a check back or or whether it's a cus or the two challenge rule where you 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 are more assertive if somebody is not responding to the uh, to the communication but as i mentioned you all of these uh, models are evidence based widely used and very helpful in terms of improving the real kind of a communication and and among the team i think we are almost uh, near to the end of the session so this is a even shorter commercial break this time can anybody spot what it is and uh, unfortunately i don't have a uh, access to the chat well it's a mountain yes which mountain is that so it's a k2 which is the second uh, largest mountain in the world it is in the pakistan and it is on the pakistan china border and uh, the most difficult mountain to 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 climb and i'm sure some of you might have seen this the picture a couple of days ago so the team of the nepali sherpas they they climbed first time in the history in the winter the k2 and i'm sure how could they have happened same teamwork communication mutual respect situation awareness all of these what what are we discussing i'm sure they must have done these and 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 that led to the this this is a story which we just came out a couple of days ago that the first time in the history uh, a team of uh, people have uh, climbed the k2 in the in the winter okay so i'm going to summarize here so uh, we have discussed uh, some of the tools and strategies uh, which are dr driven from the the team's step so in the communication i have uh, mentioned the aspar call out check back and hand off to you uh leading the team you have a brief huddle and debrief situation monitoring you have a step and i'm safe and the mutual support or the team support you have a two challenge rule and a cus and again i'm sorry if i'm a bit quicker because of this uh, kind of a losing couple of minutes uh, due to the technology disaster uh, but as i said uh, you can you can search yourself or, or or look on the literature about these ones or ask some of your colleague who are more expert to use them and incorporate them into the simulations 
and 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 i'm sure you will you will find them very very helpful so here i'm going to do my summary slides so the the so although i covered quite a kind of a wider aspect of the human factors but i summarize you to the two model which i suggested you to focus the first one was the shell model and here is this picture of the shell model again you have a assistant for the the software h from the hardware e environment and l was the liveware in the shell model and after the shell model we discuss the uh, the 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 the, uh, the team steps model now i'm not sure sara we have time to watch a video or shall we just give a time for the questions i guess we, we don't have much time so we'll i think we'll just skip this video and i'll just put my 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 last slide so the human factor and ergonomics is a discipline that aims to maximize the human performance and well-being we know that the two third of all clinical errors involve the human errors which can be preventable by improving the human factors i introduce you two models today shell model which can be used to to kind of keep your thoughts together around the human factors especially focusing on the systems which is the software equipment which is the hardware and the pupil which is the liveware in the model i also introduce you today the step model which address the 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 human factor around the teams and we 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 discuss the four or five elements of the effective teams in terms of the communication leadership uh, mutual respect and the situational monitoring and i give you some kind of a insight that these model can be integrated into the simulations and and the, during the debriefings and uh, you could do this in in the labs or you could do in the in situ uh, simulation as well i think i'm going to end the session here and here is the list of my references and i'm happy for the opening the session for any questions and further discussion thank you very much uh, again for giving me this opportunity and uh, sorry for this uh, kind of a uh, glitch in technology or human factor glitch in the presentation thank you Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jamil, for this great and uh, straight to the point presentation. And I would say consider it one of the most practical presentation was immediately applicable. Um, I would like to ask our uh, dear panelists, Dr. Tassi, Dr. Romani, if you have any questions uh, that you have to our uh, speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asaf. Thank you very much, Dr. Jamal. That's uh, it's, it's a really very fascinating talk, actually, and um, I, I have to say I learned a lot. And I'm going to ask the same question, actually, in, in, in the in the cut off time. I was wondering which which model uh, would I prefer, and which model? And basically, in both ways, when I'm teaching versus when I'm actually practicing in the middle of crisis. So, and that question goes to you, Dr. Uh, Jamal. Uh, does it make a difference and which the, one you would yeah. go for the way honestly all the models eventually talk about the human factors i mean I, as i mentioned you before if you want to if you're very good to remember the 15 step of the crisis so crm model by all means remember the 15 step of the crm model but the the the, the shell model i like because it give you a kind of a systematic approach it make you think about the different aspects and uh, first of all they not contradict to each other you know what i mean they they all talking about the same thing from different angles put it this way and as i mentioned you before sometime you can integrate the two models together for example the teams because teams mainly focus on the the the, the team productivity and sometime it it it, it although you can argue in the, in the in the team productivity you can talk about the environment as well so what what shell is talking about the systems and the environment you can still integrate in the teams model as well but uh, i think shell is good in terms of focusing especially the the systems and the hardware that it remind you and the teams is very good in terms of the 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 the, the kind of a human factor the actual personality related human factors or team related human factors so especially the communications and the leadership and followership and situational awareness so that will that will keep you more focus on that i don't know whether i managed to answer your question or uh, absolutely thanks very much thank you
Uh, thank you, Dr. Jamil, and thank you, Sarah, for the great presentation. I really enjoy every minute of it. And I, as Dr. Atasi mentioned, I learned from it. So my experience with it, my question and experience. So I will tell you my experience and I want to know like what's, what's, how can I make it better? So uh, what I do usually when I start the simulation session with the trainee, I start with the, giving the example of uh, like, what is the importance of crisis resource management? And we go through like the major elements of it. Uh, so my, and then when I debrief them, initially I start with the uh, plus delta, but I give the like the crisis resource management or like the team dynamic, the priority, and then go to the medical piece. So what is your experience with that when you debrief them, when you, when you want to highlight the human factor as well as the medical aspect of the simulation session? Do you go with the first human factor or you go with the medical part or you merge? So what's your experience in that? That's a that's, that's, that's very good question. And it, that depend upon the audience as well. And that depend upon the, the your, uh, your learners as well. So for example, I, I, tried, I tried both. So for example, when we do the, the, the session with the students, honestly, we struggle because they they are at very beginning level you know what i mean so 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 first of all the simulation is a, a spiral process so so even the when you teach the simulation you need to build up your simulation learners to the level when you can take them to the next step and take them to the next step so if you're doing a simulation first time with the audience who have never done the simulation they will struggle with the concept of the human factor the first time because they might be so stressed and they might be so kind of a uh, work out with, 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 the, with, with, the, with the knowledge base and they, they will not focus. So, so, so I'll give you an example. For example, in hospital, we started the PD step programs where we doing a weekly simulation for our resident and we got a kind of a build up program for, for them for a, for, a, for, a, for a two year rotational program. So in that program, once they've been to the lab again and again, they, 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 they kind of a, got more used to with the simulation, they got more used to with the environment, then one by one you can introduce the, the different element of the human factors. And again, you cannot put everything together in one session, you know what I mean? So you need to choose, I'm going to focus today on the S-bar and I'm going to make them practice how to use the S-bar and, 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 and then you can, you can uh, in your pre-brief or the brief, you can tell them to use and then you can debrief, you could discuss whether they use or not. And similarly, the, the other element of the different tools or, 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 or communication or teamwork or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I agree with you that, uh, and the second thing I want to say here, you know, the, it's not easy either. You know, the, the, if you, those of you who are educationalists, you know, the, the, the knowledge, skin and attitude triangle or, or triad, which we teach, the most difficult is the attitude. Similarly, if you look on the, 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 the evaluation Patrick evaluation model, Kirkpatrick evaluation model. So the most difficult is the 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 actual change in behavior, which is basically the 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 the, the characteristic in terms of your 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 your, your human factors. Now, similarly, it is difficult to to assess them as well. So I think I think if you have a set of audience which you can use them or we can build them, then you could gradually introduce even even the, so Samani mentioned about the plus delta. So plus delta is wonderful. But advocacy with inquiry is the one which will lead you more towards the underpinning the human factor, in my personal opinion, because plus delta will let you focus more on the, you did this well, you're going to do this next time. But the advocacy inquiry will 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 model. And again, that if I ask you, advocacy inquiry is very difficult to use. A lot of us find very difficult to use the the, the advocacy inquiry model uh, compared to the plus delta model in, in the debrief. So, but I think I think it's it, it, with the practice. And my suggestion will be focus one area, do not be overwhelmed, and and put seven CRM objective or, or the team's model five element in the same simulation scenario, just focus on one little thing. Today, we're going to focus on the, 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 the huddle. Today, we're going to focus on the call out and check out, closed loop communication. Today, we're going to focus on the, the, the uh, S-bar or, or handover techniques. So I think that that will be more fruitful in my opinion. Sorry, thank know. you so no no thank you so much i think I, I, that's what i'm doing but i just want to double check because sometimes you know the learner will be very occupied with their no, I, medical I, piece 
I agree. Which to me, I know that the human factor is the, like the more important, and and uh, there's this is the area which is more mistakes actually happen rather than a knowledge gap. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Amani, for your uh, amazing uh, question and the great answer, uh, which we could summarize in the, it's the importance of rebriefing and preparing the um, actual candidates uh, for what are the objectives and then choosing the right debriefing method that actually matches the level and the agenda of the uh, trainees. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, one question is, is it recommended to implement human factor uh, in an interprofessional uh, education scenario, I mean, probably he's talking about the uh, uh, the concepts that you have highlighted, Doctor. Uh, Say it. The 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 concept of the human factor is in the very nature of the interprofessional uh, education. You know, I mean, that's where you could actually practice the best in terms of the human factor. I mean, I can give you an example. So <laughs> today we were doing the, 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 the simulation with our resident and we have a very skewed number. So we have a five resident and we barely grab a nurse to do a scenario with them. But that's not reality. That's not realism. You know what I mean? In real life, it will not be five resident and one nurse. It will be four nurses or three nurses and one resident and one doctor. So the, the human factor, actually, you can very nicely... Uh, incorporate in the multidisciplinary or interprofessional uh, uh, kind of uh, scenarios. So same here. So a nurse can do a, a kind of a uh, two challenge uh, uh, kind of a tool with with the doctor. You could incorporate this in the scenario, uh, and 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 similarly the, the nurse to nurse handover, nurse doctor call. It's a multiple element of the human factor. You can you could incorporate in the in the teamwork team 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 the followership, the, the role assignment, the, the involvement of the all different uh, kind of uh, members of the team. You can, you can very easily and very successfully uh, incorporate the human factor into the multidisciplinary team or the professional teams. Okay, one more last question, uh, given the time uh, in your experience, can um, thoroughly briefing the, or briefing the learners be a substitute for giving a lecture? It's uh, more of a medical education level kind of uh, question, but I uh, would be keen to hear your answer, Dr. Sayed. You mean, you mean the, before the actual simulation? Is that what, is that what you mean, right? Uh, my understanding, the question might be a little bit vague, but my understanding is that thoroughly briefing the learners, he means like maybe simulation substitute uh, yeah. the lecture uh, style, simulation experience per se. I think simulation experience, uh, so the, the both have a different element, you know what I mean? So when you go again, your knowledge, skills and attitude to pyramid. So the both serving a different requirement. Primarily, the, the, the simulation can be used for the knowledge. And as Amani mentioned, we, a lot of us might be using this mainly for the, 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 the knowledge. But the, the whole, the, the key area for the simulation is the skills and attitude change. Now, can a simulation replace a lecture? It can replace a lecture, but it's not designed to replace the lecture. It's designed to, to work hand to hand. For example, I'll give you an example. So for example, you, 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 your learners learn about the sepsis, okay? All learners, but nurses or whatever, anybody, everybody need to know about the sepsis. So, so, learn, so let's say the nursing example. So the nurses group, I have learned today about the sepsis. What is sepsis? What is infection? What is blood, blood, blood sepsis? What is meningitis? Whatever. Now you could integrate this through a scenario. So then they will have a re-endorsed knowledge. But if you do a direct scenario without lecture, they have no clue what you're doing. Now the third scenario, which I'm getting from you, could you teach just before the session in forms of a pre-brief? You could do that. But, the, but, but then your session will be prolonged. So we sometimes do that. For example, we, we use this model for our medical students because unfortunately we don't have time to design the whole lectures for them. So we actually do this. So what we do in our undergraduate simulation program, we teach them for the first 20 minutes, which is kind of whatever the name you give them, a, 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 a pre-team, pre-simulation, -pre uh, pre-briefing or, or, or briefing or lecture. It's not a lecture, it's like a discussion. So same, same, for example, hypovolemic shock. 
So we'll discuss 20 minutes, what's hypovolemic shock, what's the signs, what's the symptoms, how to diagnose, what's the management. And then we will take them immediately to the simulation, three high fidelity simulation lab. And then where we give them an actual scenario on the hypovolemic shock and then they practice. So this reinforce the learner. So could, you could do the same learning as a lecture before, as a video before, or you could do just before the scenario as well. So you could do all, but you cannot replace each other. You know what I mean? Both have to work together. Excellent. Um, so basically the uh, different educational strategies are complementary and uh, maybe delivering knowledge is uh, maybe an underutilization of the simulation potential. And for example, in our situation, talking about crisis resource management, maybe starting with an introduction to these uh, for the naive students and then conducting the simulation experience might be more useful than actually uh, questioning them about the performance of the team after without the priori uh, knowledge. So um, with that, we come to the end of our first uh, monthly scientific activity. We'd like to thank you all for your attendance. Thank you, Dr. Jamil, also for this great presentation. And we highly encourage you to stay tuned for the monthly activities that uh, uh, proposed to be on the third Wednesday of every month. And it's going to cover a variety of uh, topics. And we also encourage you who are like, have an experience or a topic or would be keen to share um, their uh, experience with us in this monthly activity, we highly encourage you to contact us, uh, fire us an email, and we'll be more than honored to have you all um, as uh, members that share, we share experience with and learn from. Um, thank you very much all and have a wonderful night. And thank you very much again for uh, being with us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Jamil again and uh, to our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.